better for it. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. We've been in Nehemiah for some time now, about uh, four weeks. Uh, Nehemiah, I'll ask you to turn to chapter 4. Chapter 4, uh, verse 6. We've been in Nehemiah for some time now. If you need a Bible, the ushers are there to hand out Bibles. Uh, if you want to turn with me in your Bible, scroll with me in your phones, tap with me, whatever it is, however you get there, Nehemiah, that's where we're at. Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. When you have it, uh, say, my mind's made up. Mind's made up. Wow, you got there real quick. Congrats to you guys. That's great. Uh, Nehemiah 4, verse 6. So we built the wall. And the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. For the people had a mind to work. The power of a made-up mind. The power of a made-up mind. Dear God, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for your people. I thank you for this word. I thank you for who you are, Father, for the strength that you uh, give to us to make it through day after day after day, Father, for the grace that you've given us when we fall, that you lift us up, for the mercy that you've extended to us, Father. I thank you for who you are in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for the stories that are represented here of your grace, the stories that are represented here of your love, the stories that are represented here of your persistent faithfulness in our lives. I pray, Father, that as I speak, you would be seen, you would be heard, you would be felt. Do what only you can do in the lives of your people through this message, through this word. I pray that it would have the desired effect that you have for it in the lives of your people. We thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen and amen. Today is week four of our series on Nehemiah entitled, The Burden to Build. The Burden to Build. Nehemiah. A series on, on, on Nehemiah. And so what we see in in Week one, week two, week three, just to give us a little bit of a recap, is uh, the nation of Israel, due to uh, some disobedience and some really, really bad advice, is now split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And the southern kingdom of Judah is taken into captivity uh, and, and oppressed by another nation called Babylon. And this nation, Babylon, is then, uh, years later, taken into captivity and oppressed by a, another larger world nation called Persia. And so what we see here is Israel was once a, a thriving nation, but due to sin, they were split in two and they were taken into captivity. And then the nation that oppressed them was taken into captivity because sin will take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. Amen. Amen. And so, so what we see here is, is that they were dealing with some things and now they're under Persian rule. <clears throat> and Nehemiah is someone that was, was, was a, a cupbearer to the king of Persia. So he was the one that made sure that uh, the drinks were flowing, but the drinks were also safe to, to drink for the king that perhaps had uh, people trying to kill him night and day and all these different things. So he was the one that would take a, a sip first before the king would. And, but we see what, what took place in, in Nehemiah's life was he's checking with his 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 brothers and sisters and people and family that are back because the Persian king... God, how many of you know that there's no one too great that God can't turn their heart, right? And so this king of, of Persia is the one that God uses to, to, to uh, make what he wants to happen come to pass. And so he sends some people back to, to Jerusalem to rebuild. He sends some people back to Jerusalem to uh, 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 rebuild what was once lost. And so Jer uh, excuse me, Nehemiah asks his, the, the people that uh, came back to, to, to Jerusalem, he says, hey, how are things going back there? What's going on? And they say things are terrible. The wall is destroyed and, and it's not built up and we're a laughing stock. And at this, Nehemiah's heart breaks. Nehemiah's heart breaks. And what we talked about in the first message was the call and response. He saw the condition of the city. He saw the condition of the wall and he decided to answer the call. The, the following week, we talked about uh, helping hands and how it was God that, that, that showed Nehemiah favor in the sight of the king. Because Nehemiah needed the king's permission to move forward, needed the king's signature to move forward, needed the king's approval to go forward and to build. And the helping hands of God were the ones that opened the door for Nehemiah to, to, to go and build. 
And so we see Nehemiah saw success there. And in our lives, we don't want to overlook the helping hands of God that lead us in this way and guide us in this way and open doors that would have been otherwise shut and close doors that we want open but we don't know aren't good for us. And so we understand that the helping hands of God are at work in our lives. And then last week, we spoke about uh, rising and building, rise and build, rise and build. Nehemiah had to travel and to do some recon work on the wall to see how things were. He did this at night. It was difficult. It was not easy. The terrain was difficult. And it must have been extremely uh, uh, uncomfortable to, to look upon something with your eyes that you've been hearing about all this time. Look upon something that was decaying, something that was rotting, something that was in poor condition that you have a burden for, but you're, you're realizing now that you've, see, you've heard of it this whole time, but now you see it for yourself. And so he had to face this uncomfortable time and face this uncomfortable reality, but he had to rise and build. Through difficulty, he had to rise and build. And then he had to speak with people, with key leaders in the city, with important individuals to get them to want to do the same. And the text says they were able to then rise and build. And that brings us to where we are today in Nehemiah uh, chapter 4. Uh, verse 6. But before we get to chapter 4, I want to talk about chapter 3. Uh, we want to talk about chapter 3. I want to read the, uh, the first five verses of chapter 3. Now, as far as narrative goes, chapter 3 isn't the most exciting book to read of Nehemiah. Uh, but it does give a lot of information as to who was pivotal in building, what they built, and why it's important for that to take place. And so Nehemiah 4, 6 says, so we built the wall. The wall was joined together half its height for the people had a mind to work. So all in this, I, while I'm reading through, I want you to keep in mind the power of a made-up mind. The power of a made-up mind. The power of a made-up mind. Now this is Nehemiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Right? It says this. Then Elishib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it, and they set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the tower of the hundred and as far as the tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, the Zakur, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams, set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired. And then next to them, Meshalam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshelzapo, Mesh, Mesh, repaired. Let's just call him Mesh, right? <laughs> son of Mesh, repaired. And next to him, Zadok, the son of Bena, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. Now, if you read throughout the text, it, 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 it does this. It says this person repaired here, this person repaired here, from here to here, this was repaired by this person, from here to here, this was repaired by this people, from this gate to this gate, from this wall to this wall, from this gate to this gate, all throughout the text. That's, that's pretty much the summary of chapter 3. And I believe that chapter 3 is in here to show us the importance and the, the, the power of what God's people can accomplish when we work together. What God's people can accomplish when we work together. There is such an importance in unity. There is such an importance in us working together, not just to accomplish our purpose, not just to accomplish our goal, but to accomplish what the Lord wants to accomplish in our lives. And so to see, to, to, to accomplish something together, we need what? A common vision. We need a common goal. We need something to center ourselves around. And remember, before Nehemiah told anyone else what was happening, he said it to himself. And he said, we're going to arise and we're going to build. He looked at the rubble. He looked at the ruin. He looked at what they were up against. And he said, this is not how it's always going to be. We will arise and we will build. And then after he strategized, after he prayed and he planned, he had an important meeting with the leaders of Jerusalem. They were in exile for some time. They were living uh, uh, they were, and, and they were sent back to Jerusalem to build. And they were uh, uh, living with, uh, under terrible conditions for some time because they had grown accustomed to the way things were. They did not have a renewed mind. They did 
didn't have a made up mind. And so Nehemiah comes and says, how are you living this way? There's a new way to live. We can rise and we can build if you would only see it. We can rise and we would build if you would only have the strength to partner with me. We can rise and we can build. We can get this done. And so this is chapter three is what this looks like. Rising and building. This person built this, this person built this, this person built this. When you build, sometimes it's, it's, it, 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 it can be exciting, but it's hard work. It can be exciting, but it's difficult. And chapter 3 is kind of like that when you're reading through it because it, it, it gives you more of the detail and less of the, the exciting narrative of what's taking place. And so we see that even in how the, the book is, is, is laid out. Sometimes building, it's the same thing over and over again. It's consistency over and over again. It's jumping from this to this over and over again. And so what we see here, though, what's very important, what I want us to understand is the who. There are different types of people involved in building. There are different types of people involved in building. There are high priests and there are priests. There are goldsmiths and there are perfumers. There are sons of influential, powerful people who rolled up their sleeves and got to work. There's rulers of half of, half of districts. There are rulers of another districts and, and daughters are building. And uh, the Levites are, are coming together and building. And the people that worked in the temple are coming together and building. Sons are building. Daughters are building. Men are building. Women's, uh, women are building. People of status. People of power. And some that are also not in grand positions are coming together, putting their hands together, their hearts together, their minds together to work and to get the job done. And this shows us that there are different people with different levels of responsibility, with different levels of influence, and everyone was able to do their part so no one else was, had to carry somebody else's weight. Everyone was able to roll up their sleeves and see the need, roll up their sleeves and say, why should we live the way we've been living when there's a different path that we can choose? Roll up their sleeves and say, no, no, if I work on this part and you work on this part, we can get the job done together. There is power in unity. There is power in unity. There is power in unity. <clears throat> and don't let the enemy or anybody else tell you different. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 it says, I therefore, Paul is writing this. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace. Now, unity is attainable. Keeping it is difficult. Unity is attainable, but getting to a place where you are unified is also difficult. And so it takes some work for all of these people to come together, to put aside their differences and then focus on their similarities. To put aside the fact that, yeah, I'm a, I'm a goldsmith and, yeah, I'm a, I'm a perfumer. And it's like, a, I'm, you know, I work with fragrances. What do I know about building? Oh, okay, well, let's, let's roll up our sleeves and, and, and get this done. To say, oh, I'm a ruler over this nation with daughters. I'm a ruler over this nation with son or this, this land with sons. And they say, okay, let's, let's put aside whatever our differences are. Roll, roll up our sleeves and get to work for the better of our, our city. For the better of what we have to do. They put the cause over what could potentially cause conflict. And they say, you know what? This is greater than maybe some of our differences. This is greater than maybe some of our social standings. This is greater. And we have to work together to get this done. Same applies in our lives. There may be uh, the, the vision that God has given us to build. The vision that God has given us to build it may be a business. It may be uh, uh, to, to, to write something. It may be to put uh, uh, something out that could bless or impact somebody else's life. It may be uh, whatever your, your situation is, whatever your vision is, whatever your burden to build is for, whatever it is you're building, uh, it may cause you or put you in a position where you have to uh, uh, partner or work with someone who perhaps you, you maybe wouldn't under normal circumstances see eye to eye with. But for the cause, you say, okay, we can get this done. We can get this done for the good of the kingdom of God. And so it's important to know that they built and they were all unified in that. And so it's, it's uh, yes, they were unified in that and there's power in unity. And so that's, that's the who, but now we want to look very quickly at the what, what did they build all throughout the text? 
Uh, there, there, this, this phrase is sprinkled throughout the text. Uh, in verse 3, we see the sons of uh, Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams. They set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And in another verse, they'll say, they laid its beams, they set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. So they're building gates. They're building portions of the wall. They'll say, they rebuilt it. They set its doors, its bolts, its bars, and they repaired a thousand cubits of the wall. Right? So they, they laid its beams, they set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. They laid its beams, they set its doors, its bolts, and its bars, and they repaired portions of the wall. And then it says also uh, in verse uh, 29 of chapter 3, and this, says, this is said elsewhere as well, that Zadok, the son of Emer, repaired opposite his own house. And it says another individual repaired. But you'll say that, you'll see that a couple times where someone repairs opposite his own house. So we see through the text in chapter 3 that they repaired the wall plus some other areas needed to maintain life behind the wall. Right? So they repaired the wall plus some other areas that's needed to maintain life behind the wall. And so what, what we've just seen and read through shows us the importance of what? It's the importance of how you build and where you build. How you build and where you build. The quality of the work. The type of tools you use. It takes some tools and good quality to lay the beams, to set the doors, to set the bolts, to set the bars. You can't use something that isn't of good quality. And so the quality of the work must be efficient. The quality of the work must be great. The quality of the, the work must stand out from the rest. Why? Because you're not just building for you. Right? You're investing into the kingdom of God. Or you're investing into and building for something that God has laid on your heart to, to better the lives of someone else. Or perhaps even if you are building for you, you realize that it's not just about the life you live, but also the legacy you leave. Right, And so it's important to understand that when we set its beams, when we set its doors, when we set its bolts and its bars in our lives, the things that we're building, we want to endure. The things that we're building, we want to be of good quality. The things that we're building, we want to be of good repute. The things that we're building, we want to have a good reputation. In. And so we want to put our best foot forward when we build. We want to build with quality. We want to build with great structure. We want to build with a great foundation to be able to set some things in place for those that are coming behind us. Laid its beams, set its bolts and its bars. And this is said again and again and again. And then the individual repaired, repaired a thousand cubits of the wall. So the wall is being built on top of the gates. The gates are being built. The wall is being built. And we see this city that was once in rubble coming back to some, uh, some aspect, some shadow of its former glory. So that's the importance of how you build, but also look at where you build. Certain individuals, it says, this person repaired opposite his own house. Now, why, why, why do I feel that that's important? I think that's important to know because if you repair opposite your own house, you may put some more work into something that directly affects you. Right? This is opposite my crib, you know, so it's got to be fortified. I, you know, I got to be, got to be safe. Got the family here and everything. It's, it's my, my, my crib and it's opposite my house. So I, it has to be strengthened. It's got to be fortified. So when they repaired opposite their own house, you put more sometimes into something that's going to directly affect you. And so if you have stake in something, if you have invested into something, if you have sown into something, you're going to put the work in. You're going to put the sweat equity in. Why? Because you deposited something in into something bigger than yourself. And the proximity of it was close, it's opposite his own house. And so we feel that, and I, I think that it's important to, to see that these people, uh, they lived in this area. They were building something that was going to protect them, building something that was going to bless them as a result of their work. They were just not afraid to roll up their sleeves and get to work. So there's an importance in how you build and where you build. And now I want to just look at the importance of humility when it comes to being unified. Because there are some individuals who did not build with them. Did not build with them. And so 
What we see there is in verse 5 uh, of chapter 3, next to them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. Now, Nehemiah is there in a position of authority. He's the, the, the Lord in this sense, not saying God, but the Lord as far as someone who has come in and, and is now the governor over this place and making sure that this job, this work gets done. And the Tekoites, they repaired, but the nobles, the individuals over these people are saying, I'm not going to stoop down and serve someone else. Even though they're repairing something that may bless me and my people, I'm not going to stoop down and, and submit to whatever this, this, this trivial vision is. And for various reasons, what you have to understand when you're working uh, on a vision and when you're trying to push something forward is, once again, not everyone will build with you. For various reasons. The nobles, they were too proud and they thought it was perhaps beneath them to get involved. And uh, Philippians chapter 2 talks about humility. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also in the interests of others. When's the last time you engaged in helping someone for someone else's benefit and not so you could get the praise or the glory for it? When's the last time you looked at the interests of others and said, maybe I can help them for them and not wait for something to come back in, in return years down the line or sometime down the line? Verse 5 says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped or to be clung on to, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And so God became flesh and dwelt among his creation. The creator became flesh and dwelt among his creation. And if Jesus Christ could have that type of humility, the beautiful thing about Paul's writing is he says, have this mind among yourselves. It's already yours if you're in Christ. It's already yours if you're in Christ. You have the ability to walk in humility, but are you exercising that right and that strength? So we have, to, we have to look at it through the mind of Christ, through the eyes of Christ, and not think of ourselves more grand than we ought. And so for, for, for that reason, these individuals did not partner with them. And for other, and other reasons, uh, some people might not partner with you with what you're trying to do. But notice that did not stop them from working. That did not stop them from, from moving forward. You have a responsibility to build anyway. Build it anyway. Build it anyway. And so what we see here is they're having some success. They're building the wall. They're working together. They're making progress. There's now unity. There's now the, the wall being built, the gates being built up. And it's a beautiful thing. But look, look what happens if we now fast forward a little bit to chapter 4. Chapter 4 we see opposition comes on the scene. Chapter 4, verse 1. These two guys that we've spoken about before with the interesting names. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged and jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it up in a day? Will they revive the stones that are cut out of the heaps of rubbish and the burned ones at that? And Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, they're building. What are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Apparently that was like a burn. Like, hear, O God. Yeah, that, that's, that's what they say. And Nehemiah's response is, hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads. Give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. And so we see in the, the first three verses that the enemy comes in. And this word obviously gets back to Nehemiah about what was said. There's a saying it and Nehemiah has the presence of mind to, to write this. So he understands what was said. And he says that when Sanballat, when he heard that we were making progress... When he heard that we were putting our best foot forward, when he heard that the beautiful thing that God was doing in, in our lives was taking place, he was angry. He was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. He jeered at us. He mocked us, and he says, what is it that they're doing? 
Are they going to build it up in a day? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Are they going to revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish, the burned ones at that? And then Tobiah's like, ha ha, yes. This isn't strong at all. If a fox goes up on it, the whole wall is going to break. And it's interesting because the minute we're, we're moving forward and we see some progress, that's when the onslaught comes. That's when the opposition comes. So when the gossip comes, the slander comes, the words that cut and that pierce come. And whether it's the enemy speaking lies into our lives or whether he's using someone else to speak lies or speak something that, that uh, 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 depresses or, or, or weighs us down. It, it happens from time to time. He says, will they restore it for themselves? Sometimes you say, you really think you're going to get that done? Will they restore it for themselves? You really think that's going to happen for you? Really? Will they finish up in a day? You really think you have the endurance to get this thing done? You really think you're going to meet it at this specific time? Will they revive the stones out of rubbish? Look at what they have to work with. Look at what, what, what they have to work with. Look at what the odds that are stacked up against them. There's no, there's no way you can get this done. Take a look at what you're working with. You have rubbish to, to turn into revival. You have ruin to turn into restoration. And, and, and the, the stones that you're working with are burnt at that. <laughs> There's no way you can get this done. See, a tactic of the enemy is he'll often use a half-truth to lock us up. But a half-truth, a portion of that, that half-truth is still a lie. So he'll say, oh, look at what you have to work with. There's no way you can get that done. Look at what you have to work with. Sure, it's not impressive. Sure, it's small, but there's no way you can get that done. Do you, know, do you know who I serve? Do you know who is with me on this journey as I'm moving forward? Do you know who has called me to this task? Yeah, sure, I, I have some limited resources, but I, have the God, I serve the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I serve the God who is for me and not against me. I serve the God who says, if you pray and ask, it shall be given unto you. I serve the God. And so the beautiful thing about that is sometimes we get tied up by the half-truth. We get tied up by the lie. And we say, oh, oh, yeah, you know, look at what I have to work with. Look at what I have to overcome. I'm trying to, I'm trying to create new family patterns for my, my kids and for those that are coming behind me. But look at what I have to overcome. I have, uh, my, my father wasn't present and, and my mother did this. And all of these different things uh, uh, took place in my life. And I'm trying to, to undo what was done in the lives of those that are coming behind me. And the enemy's looking at you saying, oh, you think you can overcome that? Nah, look at what you have to work with. And he's trying to, to keep you stuck, to keep you stagnant, to have you give up. What does the text say? The thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10. 10. And the amazing thing is, it doesn't often look that way at first. But we see here this gossip. We see here this slander. We see here them laughing at the enemy and trying to shrink them down to size. But look at what Nehemiah's response is when the enemy comes against them. Nehemiah says, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. That's a heavy prayer. It's a heavy prayer. That's a, a David Psalm type prayer. Like God smite them and send them back. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But you have to think about it because the enemy does not want you to build. The enemy does not like what God has called you to build. The enemy does not like the vision that you carry. Doesn't like the thing that you feel the Lord has, call, has called you to give birth to. And he doesn't want to see you build for any kingdom but his. He doesn't want to see you build in your marriage. He doesn't want to see you build in your relationship with your kids. He doesn't want to see you build in your relationships at your job. He doesn't want you to build in your relationship with Christ. And so he's going on the offensive to tear you down. To steal your joy, to steal your zeal, to steal your energy, to steal your passion, to steal your vision. To kill what God has give, given you to birth. And to ultimately destroy the lives of those that were called to be impacted by whatever it is that was laid on your heart. That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to see take place. And so Nehemiah, realizing that the enemy is up to no good, prays a, a dangerous prayer, prays a warfare prayer, because he values his vision. 
he values his vision and he realizes that this is too precious for me to just let them steal. This is too precious for me to just let them come and try and take. My zeal is too precious. I have to, what, what, what's the term we, we say now? I have to what? Protect my peace, right? I have to protect my peace. And so often we let the opinions of others get in our head, get in our ears, take root in our heart, and our peace is gone, our joy is gone, our zeal is gone, our dedication to the mission is gone. But I declare in Jesus' name that we're taking our joy back, we're taking our peace back, we're taking our mind back, we're taking our peace back so that we can build. Because we have to have a mind to work. We have to have a mind to get it done. But people had a mind to work. And, and so many times people come in and they'll say this and they'll say that or they'll do this and they'll do that. And they'll knock you off course. And before you know it, you've put the vision on the shelf for so long. It's collecting some dust. And God is saying, no, 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 let's, let's, let's revisit this. I haven't called you to lay this down. I've called you to pick it up and to run with it. It's not too late. I'm going to restore those years. That the locust is eaten. We can get this thing done in the name of Jesus Christ. We can get this thing done in the name of Jesus Christ. As long as there is breath in your lungs, there is a vision, there is something that God has called you to do. Someone that God has called you to impact. We just have to value the vision and not let it go. We have to value the vision and stay committed to what God has called us to do. The power of a made up mind. The power of a made up mind power of a made-up mind. So this begs the question, how will you respond to opposition? How will you respond when it comes your way? Because it will. Nehemiah, we see, prayed with faith, prayed with confidence, prayed with zeal. Do we do the same? Can we do the same? Can we say, I will lift mine eyes to the hills from where my help comes from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one that does not slumber, that does not sleep. He is for me and not against me. No weapon that stands against me is going to, to prosper. And so I know this, and so I can turn to God in my time of need, turn to God in my time of affliction. How do we approach the throne? It's okay to approach the throne of God broken. Because God is a God that binds up. It's okay to approach the throne of God wounded. You don't have to have it all together coming to God saying, look, God, I need some help. The, the, the sacrifices of God are what? Uh, what, he, what he does not despise is what? A broken spirit and a contrite heart. And God is near to the brokenhearted. And some of the words that have been spoken over you, some of the words that have been spoken over your vision, some of the words that have been spoken into what God has called you to do have perhaps caused you to be limping, to be wounded, to be brokenhearted. And so uh, perhaps that's even driven you to put up walls and go away from God. But that's the time when you need to draw closer to God because God is close to the brokenhearted and near to those that are crushed and broken in spirit. And so what we need to do is draw near to God and say, look, Lord, I want to pray. Even in my brokenness, I can pray in faith. Even though my faith is struggling, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Even though I'm dealing with uh, my confidence, Lord, I'm praying knowing that you have the authority. And God, even though I'm not really sure, I'm praying. God, knowing that you believe that this can get done, Father. And I want to pray with the power of the Holy Spirit as I approach you. So how do we respond to opposition? Are there some things that take place that we let the opposition strip us of our power, strip us of our joy? But I want us, I want us to see something here in verse 6. The verse that we started with. So we built the wall. And the wall was joined together to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. So we built the wall. The beautiful thing about this is the opposition came and they didn't stop building. Yo, get this. The opposition came their way. They said what they said. But yet they still built. They did not put the bricks down. They didn't put the hammer down. They didn't put the nails down. In spite of what was said, they still built. In spite of what was done, they still built. Because they had a made up mind to get the job done. 
They had a resolve to get the job done. Too many of us, we throw in the towel after a couple harsh words, but we need a mind to get the job done, a resolve to get the job done, a renewed mind that's not kept in bondage by the things that were said, but that's liberated and freed and said, it's God that's called me. It's God that's going to keep me. Where's the hammer? I'm getting to work. Where's the hammer? I will keep building. I'm going to build in spite of what they say. I'm going to build in spite of what they do because it's not just about me and this needs to get done. This has got to get done because it's bigger than me. It's about what God wants. So don't let their words stop you from building. Don't let their gossip stop you from building. Don't let the discouragement stop you from building. Don't let the pain stop you from building. Don't let your sorrow stop you from building. Build it anyway. Build, build it anyway. Build it anyway. And so there was progress made. It says we built the wall to half its height. We're halfway done. It's amazing because it was rubble before. It was rubble before, and we built the wall to half its height. Celebrate your progress. Celebrate the progress that you have made. Even if you're not exactly where you want to be just yet, where you want to go just yet, look back on the progress you have made. Say, I'm not where I was. This wall is no longer in rubble. It's no longer in ruin. God has brought me from here. And he's brought me a mighty long way. And I know he's not going to bring me this far just to leave me. There's more to go. Yes, Lord. So celebrate your progress. Just take two seconds wherever you are and just give God praise for your progress. For your progress. The fact that you are not where you used to be. The fact that even though the building is difficult and you're not completed yet, you're still working on it. You're still getting the job done. You're still able to roll up your sleeves. And if you look back. On this time last year, you're, you've made some steps that you didn't think you could make. You've overcome some hurdles that you didn't think you could overcome. Hey, thank you, Lord. 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 That's the power of a made up mind. The power of a mind that surrendered to God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. The same way sin can kind of keep you further than, take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. Our God is the God that can exceed our even greatest expectations. Some of us, we, had no, we have no business being in the place we're in now, but God. Opened the doors, but God. Kept the doors closed, but God. Ordered our steps, but God. So I'm thankful for the progress. I'm thankful for the progress. So they, 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 they built the wall to half its height. And that's a beautiful thing because the people had a mind to work. They had a made up mind, a renewed mind, the mind of Christ, a resolved mind, a one track mind. For the people had a mind to work. You can't get this vision done and be afraid of hard work. You can't get this vision done and be, be afraid of sacrifice. You can't get this vision done and be afraid of late nights. Whatever it is God's laid on your heart, you can't get this vision done and be afraid of confrontation. You can't get this vision done and be silent when you should speak up. You can't get this vision done and be afraid to ask the difficult questions. You can't get this done without burning the midnight oil, without rising early, right? There are certain sacrifices and things that we have to do, but they got the wall to half its height because the people had a mind to work. Had a mind to work. It doesn't say you, you don't rest. It doesn't say you don't have a, a time of Sabbath, but you have a mind to work. You say, look, I'm, I, I have a vision that has to be accomplished. There's something that's got to get done. And I have a mind to work. I'm not afraid of hard work. I'm not afraid of rolling up my sleeves and getting to work and doing the job and getting it done. So as I close, my prayer for us, Bethel, is that we would come to know personally through our experience the power of a made-up mind. That we would know the power of a made-up mind. That we would know the power of a unified people. People that link arms from perhaps different social statuses, different uh, 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 backgrounds. 
different ethnicities, whatever it is, that we link arms and know the power of, of, of unity. That we would know the power of people who keep building no matter what they say. That we would know the power of a people who know that the vision is too great to throw in the towel. That we would know the power of a people who know that the burden is too, the burden to build is too great to abandon what God has laid on your heart. That we would know the power of a people who know that Christ is our anchor, Christ is our hope, Christ is our foundation, and in him, in him, it's in him, it's through him that we have our living, our being, and our identity. That, that, that we would know the power of, of the fact that our God is a, is a mighty fortress. Our God is a protector. Our God is with us in the trenches. That we would know the, 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 the ability to know that, that in, the, in the midst of our trials, we would know this. That God is for us. In the midst of our trials, we would know this. In the midst of our building, we would know this. That God is with us. So that's my prayer and that's my focus. That we, would, that we would know this, saints of God, that we would know it in our own lives, in our own individual spheres of influences, in our homes, in our schools, in our jobs. We would also know it right here in this church, that God would do his work and that we would do our work, that we would work and fight for unity, that we would stop gossip at the root, that we would roll up our sleeves and not be afraid to do the work. Not be afraid of, of, of praying the difficult prayers for this house. Not be afraid of sowing the seed for this house. Not be afraid of, of being the people that God has called us to be and saying the prayer for someone that maybe looks like they're going through something because it's not just the pastor's job to do it. If you have the spirit of God on the, in, on the inside of you, and if you've been redeemed by the blood of the land and if God has set you free, your, your prayer has power. There's authority in your prayer. And I want us to be a people that are united, a people that, uh, 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 that partner with what God is doing. And that aren't too tied down to agenda or to what we think is right. But we can say, God, have your way. We can take our hands off and say, God, have your way. Let us work and watch you work. And let's work together to get this thing done. And no matter what, come what may, let's stay focused, let's stay resolved. Because the people have a mind to work and we have to have a made up mind. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for who you are, who you've called us to be. You're worthy to be praised. So if you're here and you've heard this message and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have a relationship with him, and you would like to today, you want to uh, come to get to know Jesus uh, uh, for yourself, as your own Lord, your own Savior, and perhaps you've been relying on someone else's prayer, on someone else's uh, uh, relationship with God. <clears throat> and God is saying, I want you to know me for you. I want you to know me for you. So if, if that's you, if you're here, you know you have not asked the Lord for forgiveness for any of your sins, and you're just living however you want to live, and you feel God tugging at your heartstrings today. You feel God uh, uh, saying, hey, come, come to me, draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. So if that's you, if you don't know Jesus and you want to come to know him today, I'm going to ask you just to be honest. You're not coming to me. You're not coming to the church. Be honest with yourself and just, just raise your hand. If that's you, if you say that's me, I'm in need of a savior. I'm in need of Jesus. I want to make things right. I want to be made new. I want to be made whole. I want to be cleansed from my, my sin. I want to, I've been do, trying to do it my way. And now I want to surrender my way and do it God's way. And so if that's you, if you want Jesus today, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand. Is there anyone here? We don't want to embarrass you. We're not trying to put you on the spot. We just want to be sure that your soul is, is, is secure and that you know that, that God is for you and with you. Is there anyone here that doesn't know Jesus but you want to come to know him? Maybe you were once walking with him, but over time you decided to do your own thing, be your own person, go your own way. <clears throat> and you saw the fruit of that and it's painful. And you want to make a decision for Christ today. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Is there anyone here that says, that's me, I'm in need of Jesus, I'm in need of a savior? All right. I'm going to ask everyone just to stand very quickly, very quickly, very, everyone standing. If you're here and you're just unsure, perhaps, of where you would go, if the Lord were to call you from here into eternity, tomorrow is not promised for any of us. And uh, if you're unsure of where you would go and you want to be sure, you want prayer, 
Uh, we have people that are, pray, are here, to, willing to, here and willing to pray with you and for you. If you want to be sure of where you'll go when you leave this life, uh, if you're unsure right now, I'm going to ask you to remain standing. And if you are sure, please take your seats. Is there anyone here that just wants prayer? Okay. So, dear God, I thank you for your people. I thank you for your sons. I thank you for your daughters. I thank you for our, uh, the lives that you've called us to live. I thank you for the burden to build. I pray, Father, that as we move forward together as one, that we would fight for unity, Jesus. That we would fight for peace. Once we obtain unity, Father, I pray that we would fight to keep it. I come against the enemy that would cause division in this house, that would cause division in our lives outside of this house, that would cause division in our marriages, division in our, with our children, division at our jobs, division. I pray for unity, God, amongst your people. I pray, Father, for a mind that's made up that despite the opposition, Lord, we will continue to have that resolve that you are for us, you are with us. And because you are for us, all things are possible. We thank you, we praise you, we give you glory. We ask you all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Thank you, Lord.